Great. And uh, we're live from Pivotal Labs here and about to be introduced. Here we go. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, great. Uh, thanks everyone for coming today to our Tuesday Tech Talk at Pivotal Labs. Um, I'm Penny and I help coordinate uh, Pivotal Labs uh, if you're not familiar with the space of like a software consulting company. Uh, and we'd be happy to talk to you about it if you have questions after. But right now we're going to hear from Daza Greenwood. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. Awesome. Um, so Daza is a founder of Civics.com, which is a boutique provider of professional consultancy services for digital business, business and trust networks. So Civics.com enables organizations to deploy cross-boundary data flows, transactions, and other services using an integrated business, legal, and technical architecture and design methodology. The engagements are tailored uh, to purpose and leverage innovative solutions for digital identity, data policy, and technology strategy. Um, a little background is at, uh, MIT, uh, at MIT since 1997, Jazza held various academic and research appointments, including visiting scholar, lecturer, and scientist. Uh, and does all develop repeatable methods for integrated business, legal, and technical tech, technical design and development of systems or services that were owned over decades of private consulting and released under uh, open MIT licenses. Currently, at the MIT Media Lab, Daza's research focus is on integrated legal and technical code, enabling trusted identities in the cyberspace, reliable big data analytics, and legitimately fair personal data sharing. So uh, that's a, a, a good start for the intro. Um, and so he's going to get started by telling us about his most recent project. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hack. Hack. <laughs> and uh, oh, it seems like your mic might not be on just yet. Um, and then after that, we'll have some time for Q and A. Thank you very much. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, so this is a project um, that is open source and I'd say very exploratory um, from the MIT Media Lab that, um, that we're calling iAuth. <clears throat> um, it's um, a project that has grown out of the research work of Professor Sandy Pentland, who um, runs the Human Dynamics Lab and basically the focus is on use of big data um, to gain um, insight, especially into uh, human behavior and groups and population and um, trends. So um, you could think of it sort of like um, using epidemiological techniques or um, almost advertising techniques. Um, but um, let's just say from uh, from a approach that he calls reality mining. Um, so we like real time data, and we especially like data from individuals. Um, so unlike most social sciences, uh, which are definitely quantitative. And when I was an undergraduate, like I had a clipboard and surveys for like Psych 101, um, and we had uh, and in economics I did regression analysis. Certainly quantitative. The difference here is that um, the types of statistical models and um, analytics are more like what we would think of as modern data science, and less. And then specifically based on um, the models, like machine learning, are derived from the data directly and not from an assumption. Um, like a uh, rational actor in economics or, um, you know, say, a psychological model um, like um, Freudian or something. So um, that's why we like the data right from the people. Um, we like individually identifiable data, which also is somewhat shunned in social sciences. You know, typically um, for research, um, the um, game is about anonymization and um, aggregation and uh, perturbing the data so that individuals are not identifiable. So um, just to give some context for this IAuth app, um, I, um, the project that started it was um, in the media lab where I spent um, part of my time as a researcher, um, not the civics.com consulting that um, Hedy mentioned. In the media lab, um, DARPA um, granted a project to Professor Pentland's group to um, develop um, um, a method for uh, the Pentagon to um, do a better job in identifying vets returning from the wars who were suffering from uh, depression and post-traumatic stress syndrome were the two key ones. Uh, and so they threw a lot of money at it in different ways, uh, most of it more traditional um, clinical. Some of it went uh, to the media lab to do something more exploratory, and it was to basically work on a, a platform out of our lab called Funf, which gets sensors, uh, all the sensor readings from Android phones, and um, puts them in a nice single package that's easy to, you know, um, work with, um, you know, little, no wrangling needed, and um, 
And uh, from that, um, it turned out that it was demonstrated that um, it was possible mm -hmm. to have a very high degree of uh, predictive confidence um, when um, condition, uh, depression or post-traumatic stress syndrome um, were present. And that's partly because these are behavioral. Um, they're based upon observation. It's not, there's no blood test. Um, and the phones are really, really good at um, creating and preserving and transmitting um, data about behavior. And so, for example, if you think, we, at no point did we get the um, payload of email, for example, or of uh, text, but just the metadata, um, you know, showing patterns of contacts with others uh, is extremely telling mm -hmm. about people's mindset and um, how they're doing and um, kind of their trajectory in a social environment. Mm -hmm. You know, um, GPS is great to see um, a great deal and um, accelerometers and gyroscopes can tell you a lot about um, how people are walking. You know, with um, early onset of Alzheimer's, that's another important uh, area. Slight changes in the way people walk, and the way people walk is very signature, um, can be a very, very good indicator of early onset of dementia uh, or um, Alzheimer's. This can be picked up with the um, accelerometers and gyroscopes and the phones very easily. Um, and uh, Similarly, for um, the DARPA study, you know, when people are not leaving the house so much, when they're not communicating as much with other people, um, as you can tell from you know the metadata and uh, some other tells like that, a fairly thin slice of the data to, turned out to be very predictive. So the game that I was playing as a former uh, lawyer in this um, project was basically all about how do how does one. Um, have a valid, uh, you know, legitimate uh, method for the Pentagon to get incredibly intimate data about that's after they're back from the war. In some cases, they'd be civilians at that point. I mean, um, it, it almost sounds like the kind of thing that would that you wouldn't want, you know, in like uh, some dystopia of uh, uh, where the government has a bunch of information about everybody and they're trying to help us. Um, and so. Um, that was a pickle, um, and it required some you know, really deep thinking. And uh, eventually, um, we basically embraced, again, an idea from Sandy Pentland, which is what he calls a new deal on data. And the vision is that in order to get the most out of the potential of big data, we need to use individual identifiable data. That's a big part of it, in fact. And the only way to do that legitimately is where people um, own and control their own personal data. Uh, radical though that may sound by today's standards, where almost all of our data is you know, fractured across um, third-party systems, and very literally when we click the buttons uh, accepting terms and conditions, we are assigning and transferring you know, ownership, or um, the, the equivalent of ownership rights, and uh, we can't really track where it is, we're not sure who's looking at it or what's being done with it from that point forward, nor we're necessarily sharing in like a fair value exchange. Um, and more to the point, um, it's kind of quicksand for the companies and government agencies that are relying on it. It's hard to be having been on the other side of that many times. It can be hard to get behind bold, you know, heavy duty action um, premised on personal data that maybe has iffy legal or political um, basis to have because you know you're never sure where a bad headline or a lawsuit or a political um, dust up is going to come with personal data. It's like can be like a third rail. So what, what's truly needed to transition, to make the most of big data, to, to um, you know, really come to a digital footing in the economy, like big, as well as for every company, is to be able to have a legit basis. A New Deal on data provides that. And um, it's actually not so different from the laws in Europe, where people have um, deep rights to the personal data. Um, we don't have a privacy directive like Europe. And so what we did for the DARPA project, or what I did was came up with a contract-based framework. So basically every party in the contracts had a um, enforce, legally enforceable by contract um, uh, even playing field that reflected similar rights to the fair information practices, the kind of rights you get if it was, if you say you had HIPAA covered data or um, school records, you know, um, like the school can't just give your transcript to anybody or your disciplinary record. Um, it requires consent. Same with your medical records. Um, actually, same with bank, um, Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, financial privacy. And um, turns out it's the same with quite a few bodies of uh, records in the United States. Since um, Nixon um, uh, sort of implosion, um, there was 74 onward for several years, we had quite a blossom of privacy laws that were actually similar or better, in my view, than the current European privacy laws, giving people um, very complete rights to their personal data in terms of um, 
control, um, knowing where it is, um, being able to ask for a copy of it, uh, being able to, um, um, if there's something inaccurate, uh, basically correct the record. And all these are basically good information hygiene. So um, cribbing from some of these um, fundamental rights, fair information practices, they're called, or you know, the wrapper that we use in um, Sandy's lab is a new deal on data. It's actually a pretty old deal on data. Um, uh, every, every party agreed to those terms as though it was a statute, but they did it in contract. So as I was trying to figure out how to really do that so it wouldn't cost too much and it would um, reflect and support existing business practices and systems and you know the same technology that we're using already, um, it became clear very quickly that um, the, the pivotal point, if you will, was the OAuth 2 tokens. Um, so it's that token exchange um, where all the action is. That's where you can get full alignment of the business, legal, and technical dimensions of the um, creation of new value, of the um, creation of a new asset class of personal data um, used in the aggregate to do some pretty important things, to save a lot of money, potentially make money to make value, uh, and uh, it also aligns a point when an individual has given literal direct actual consent. If you think about it, when you see that little thing pop up, or if you're a developer and you've created them, the action required is like a physical action. Like the user, whatever, like mouses or clicks, the there's a user action required to consent to terms that the user sees. Um, that's legit right there. The terms we see aren't always that terrific. Um, you know, frequently they almost come across as an afterthought. I've been collecting them for years now um, and looking at them and uh, they're not always carefully construed uh, or reviewed but if you look at Facebook, Google for sure, uh, Twitter, all the big companies and many of the many smaller companies like the startups from our lab that do um, clinical use of uh, data using fun for example those terms are very heavily negotiated and they exactly reflect uh, what's in the contracts and they absolutely reflect the fundamental business deal the deal between the parties. I started realizing okay so first of all for that DARPA thing it's it's, uh, if you want to look at those contracts and the system rules, those are available um, for free. They're a bit heavy uh, because the parties were kind of heavy. But the, uh, the underlying design concept was good. I felt it had legs, so we kept noodling on it. And it was basically to come up with a simple well, design pattern, a reusable design pattern that was generic that would permit um, any company that was, let's call it a resource provider or an authorization provider, and any individual that was utilizing um, OAuth 2 to grant access to protected resources, which, which is what it does, um, could basically know in advance that that would be the moment that you should be careful about the words to make sure they line up um, with uh, the deals and to be careful with logging so that everybody has a, a real log of what happened exactly and to be careful with maintaining the endpoints so that um, if you, for example, do a token revocation, like we want that endpoint to know when a user has revoked authorization from either side. Um, it's available if you look at Google or GitHub and others, like they will give you endpoints. So when, if you have an app and you revoke, um, uh, and a user revokes authorization for your app with Google or GitHub, there is an endpoint that you could, if you cared to um, um, let Google or GitHub know that the token's been um, the authorization has been revoked and they will cancel it. Um, a lot of times we don't necessarily do that because you know, no one's asking us and you think so long as I separate the um, authorization on my side, um, we're good, right? Well, sure, um, and as long as we just do any sloppy words we want in that moment and the authorization we're good, right? Yeah, I guess. But the opportunity is to be a little bit better at that and to actually do two or three things right with logging authorization, logging revocation of authorization, and lining up the terms with the contracts and the deal, if we just take a little more care and involve business, legal, and technical people, just a little at the same time, not a lot, um, it's possible to unleash a major source of untapped value. Here's how. So um, I wanted to show you now um, something that we have, so this has been more or less an idea for like a couple of years with very not great um, prototypes and proofs of concept that have done um, with grad students or just whoever would, you know, 
cared about it. Uh, no one's paying for this at this point, and so it's been hard to get things together. Thanks to Pivotal Labs and um, uh, like doing a TED talk on this, I was, you know, that can be very clarifying in the mind, thinking, well, gosh, what am I going to show? Um, and so we have hacked something together up until the wee hours this morning, and by golly, I think it actually works. Uh, and um, to show you what we have done, um, we've got a Node app that um, demonstrates um, what we have. And so let me just um, go to Akshith for a moment. Um, yeah. Akshith, um, what I'm, it, oh, wait, now I should say there's two volunteers here. Um, so a lot of the work I do, you would call civic hacking. So someone from Code for America is here. Uh, and uh, Le Massachusetts legal hackers are, I think, falling online. Um, and I, I just love hacking as a volunteer. Um, a lot of good things can happen. Uh, and um, here's one of them. So Akshif, um, who lives in India, was a participant in a January short course I did on blockchain and uh, legal intensive. Um, and uh, Gabriella, who is next to Akshif here, um, can you see that? Yep. Gabriella uh, uh, also um, was a really great contributor and helped me run the class. Uh, she's here in Cambridge at this moment. So there's a couple, like, these are not MIT students, but they're behaving like um, great MIT students uh, with the code. And um, actually, uh, if you, do you want me to just hit the video of the Node app that you brought together and then um, answer questions live? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, great. So because if you rely on a live demo from India, it will never work. We've taken the precaution of making this video. Of course, it is working now, but we've got the video, so let's play the video. Why is the volume is quite soft? Can you hear that volume? Yeah. Why is oh, I think I it's funny, it was live on my computer. All righty. So I think what I'll do is I'll just kind of talk through it a little bit. Um, so what you wait, is this paused? Okay. Yeah. So what you're what you see here is um, a front is, is a front screen of an app that we uh, put together. That lets you log in with GitHub or with Google. Okay. Um, and um, Short, the next thing we'll implement is um, is uh, login with MIT, which also supports OAuth 2, now in addition to Kerberos, uh, OpenID Connect specifically. Uh, what you have, can make this a little bigger? Yeah, good. Um, so once you log in, yeah, here we go. Um, once you log in, you see um, a little a little screen that says. Um, Basically, I've taken the the permissions that you get and I put them at the top of like the user's profile. Okay, um, so if they want to know what they're what they've agreed to, rather than digging for like usually like a apps permissions page, it's under a settings page, it's under a account management page, it's under a preferences page. It's under it's hard to find, frankly, uh, for most people. Uh, many people don't know it exists that you can review the apps that have been authorized uh, from a service. We just kind of put it right up front and center, uh, and at near the top of the page. And the idea is to see what it would be like to delete the terms and conditions, delete the privacy policy. I know it's scary, um, but recognize that they don't work. They're broken. People don't read them. If they did, they wouldn't necessarily be better off. They're hard to understand. They're hard to parse. I, I have trouble reading them, uh, and uh, replace it with something that could work. Something that could work could be something like what you see with a one-sentence human-readable summary of an authorization that you can click on and understand more about the nature of the resource, and you can get paragraphs if you do click on those things. Um, if what, we, what you could do, and I've done this with some city clients in particular that are trying to have better um, uh, uh, plain language uh, and understandable agreements for click-through for citizens, you can basically just bottom line the two, three, four, five key terms, like we're not liable for anything. You own the data. You agree to share data with the following parties and then plop in GitHub, plop in um, Evernote. As, as people agree to those permissions, you can have, in effect, a dynamic contract. 
um, that actually does demonstrate the sum of the obligations of the parties at any given time. Because that's what happens when you look at the currently authorized apps. It, you should see a then current listing of the apps that you've authorized. Right? Um, and, uh, and when you revoke one, it disappears. So here is, um, this is basically a screen. Um, it, let me just back up for a moment and say the, the architecture of this was absolutely not built so that we could just demonstrate something that we could demonstrate you know, with paperware or PowerPoint slides. It was built to have three, four um, fundamental um, capabilities that should, in principle, be able to be standardized, formalized, built upon and scaled because they have the right things, the right business, legal, and technical things. Um, one of those things is a capability for people to, in a sense, own their own identity at some level. And so when I say own their own identity, I don't mean that if you're a bank or an, a company that they'll take over your account system, um, that would be bad. Uh, what I do mean is that at some point there is some source of identity, um, some credential that um, goes with them, that um, is theirs, that when they consent they're doing so on their own behalf and not only as an employee um, through an X500 director, some LDAP service um, through their employer, but not only in their capacity as a Google customer, but actually they themselves can consent. At some point that's important. Like we consent to be governed, yet there's no mechanism for that. And consent is a two-person two or more party transaction. I can't consent to myself. You need two different parties. So consenting from inside somebody's account system actually does not parse. It doesn't, it's illogical. Somehow people need to have an identity from which they identify themselves and can offer consent and can revoke consent meaningfully. Um, like sometimes through no fault of our own, um, we don't revoke consent correctly. Um, like just hacking this app, we frequently thought we were, you know, deactivating things and disconnecting endpoints, and we hadn't. Uh, being able to have people from a stand externally is important to keep everything honest and also for portability. So the way we do that is through a JSON file. So um, Akshith was very, very patient with me, and he, um, instead of just having environmental conditions in Heroku or putting things in a Mongo database as you normally would for an account system, and maybe having you know aspects of an account or a, or a profile of a user just be dynamically generated from whatever you have laying around and not necessarily subject to a very high bar. We just we, we took a subset and said the account, the identity of the person is what exists in an account file, and that file is a JSON object, UTF-8 encoded, just right in the root of the server or, or near right on the server in a directory where we're putting them all. What that means is that at any given point, a person could look at their file, their account, and they could, you know, JSON isn't particularly readable, but it's not unreadable, and it can certainly be arrayed so people could see, oh, here's my name, here's my um, current authorizations, here's my address, um, here is my identity in a sense. Um, and what we're doing with the apps for this is we're actually having people go to, for this service, we're having them go to a couple of different apps. One of them is Google, another one's a Node is service. Um, we don't really want Google to own the identity of our people. We don't also want to run an entire identity service for these apps. So what we're doing is we're encapsulating identity in a UTF-8 encoded file. And guess what? Now you get portability. So you know this is hard with identity systems to think of portability across domains. Um, it can be tricky. There's a lot of ways to do it that are inefficient and hard to understand. Uh, I can tell you firsthand, um, but this may be a simpler way, which is um, if you wanted, if you had a system of identity as consumers or citizens that was encased in an account file that represented your identity, your core identity, your root identity, and you wanted to go, say, from Google hosting it to doing it on your own service or some MIT, ACLU service, whatever, some identity RS service, you can port it. Just move, you can move the file, keep a system of pointers so people know where that file is, it can always um, have a non-authoritative source in, you know, more performance, you know, data-driven, um, you know, like uh, systems. But the authoritative source of the data, the account file, can literally be a hashed, you know, secure, um, publicly verifiable file that you could read, know, have, own. You can own your own identity and be a free person that can, is capable, again, of consenting to be governed, for example. You can, and here's how. Um, so that's one of the features. Uh, second thing is, and it's working, which is the most remarkable part. It, um, it's funny, you know, we forget how to 
make file, modify file, because it gets buried in these frameworks and the complexity is hidden. And so this is just like uh, designed, uh, we're moving from Heroku to Ubuntu next um, on AWS and a mirror server in the Media Lab. And I'm really thinking, wow, it's terrific to go back to the primitives and the rudiments of just create file, modify file, um, and not um, being lost in frameworks that um, disintermediate us from fundamentally what's happening with the authoritative data. Um, so for some things, that's okay for a lot of things. It's simple and it's faster. For certain things, it may be better to go to the old ways, of, you know, like a change mod and, uh, you know, like an actual file that in a, in a sense is uh, authoritative. Um, here is um, an example of the how people add accounts. Um, and, yep, there we go. There's the authoritative file. Uh, it reflect, and when you, so right now we, I think Achit has done a really terrific job after some back and forth, but he just represents them from the, the services that we currently have uh, registered, which is GitHub and uh, Google. You can see it's like true or false. Um, and so the true ones are the ones that are currently authorized. We have precisely one scope for each service, which is login. Um, the next step on the roadmap you'll hear in a moment will be to bring on a few more scopes, like um, you know, give me a copy of my account file. Um, so that's create a like, post. It's basically make a commit in, my, in a repository or you know, put something in Drive, for example, in the corresponding scopes. Um, we will bring on MIT shortly. Um, that will be a third. And uh, because we're really relying on OpenID Connect um, uh, design uh, for OAuth 2, it's not just OAuth 2, like, um, that leaves most things to your imagination. OpenID Connect is a slightly more um, defined um, extension of OAuth 2 that includes a concept of certain endpoints and certain um, common claims uh, for um, it's more enterprise facing, but it still works perfectly well for individuals. So we're using OpenID Connect version of, um, of OAuth 2, totally backward compliance on so any o o OAuth 2 thing that you guys are doing, your clients are doing, does not break when you add OpenID Connect. What you do get, however, is, for example, a dynamic registration of services the same way across infinitely scalable networks um, and um, the ability to propagate um, the types of registries needed to see in our case, if now we have, say, 50 providers that we allow um, and another IAuth provider has, say, 75, that is absolutely knowable at endpoints, you know, that can, um, that can um, stay in sync in ways that I won't get into right now. Um, okay, so let's go forward. Oh, deactivate is critical. You know, consent is meaningless unless you can revoke consent. Just leave it right there. Uh, and... Um, I'd say if there's three words that I would uh, use uh, for uh, the um, kind of d the design mantra, it would be number one, interoperability, or, or, or almost like a framework and technology agnosticism, which is why it is we are um, utilizing um, you know um, things that you know you could implement the same way in Python and Django or in uh, Node or, or elsewhere. It's a UTF-8 encoded JSON file. It's the authoritative source. You know, we keep um, the authorizations in a certain directory that's expected. A few other things like that. Uh, the, um, so I'd say that's for ma uh, maximum interoperability, but mostly agnosticism to whatever technologies and stacks people want to use. That's really up to them. Number two it is just more how you, if you configure it a certain way, you can get adva certain advantages, engineering advantages or identity. Number two, I'd say, is extensibility. And by that, what I mean is um, if you want, if people are adding on, um, say, in their agreements, um, log in with GitHub and, uh, and uh, Google today, um, you know, tomorrow there could be, you know, like Schmoogle or whatever, um, some other um, thing that we don't know about now. Just merely by onboarding, as you normally do in your business, um, your contract terms can now keep pace by modularizing and encapsulating legal content. We can now begin to engineer legal content so that it cannot be so chaotic and such a feels like a quicksand sometimes. It, uh, it, some of this can be engineered through workflow. So uh, the extensibility allows you to basically extend the terms, but also the parties. Just like snapping in a new service um, to a good service bus, you don't have to re-engineer the service. Same with the law. So it's extensible with the legal terms. It's extensible with the technical service just because it's just OAuth 2. And the final one I'd say is portability. Um, so we've got, um, by that I mean literally a user can now, finally, 
um, consider their, um, the account file something that is theirs, truly theirs, uh, that is merely hosted by a steward, uh, and that they can take from one provider to another. So in our case, um, it's literally coming up with a smart cities um, thing we're doing uh, with Kansas City, Missouri, and with some law schools and MIT and other places. And we already have had some students go from like a law school to like a foundation that's funding and to other places. And it happens at a lot in the world when people move from one job to another. First day, last day, onboarding and offboarding is a nightmare. Uh, you know, I see dead people all the time on identity jobs, you know, there's like in NASA and lots of places that's like not secret, like deep provisioning accounts is, we don't do that right because we have not engineered it and part of that's legal, you know, frankly, just take responsibility. But now that's, you know, we're, the web is not a fad, like it's time to engineer business legal and technical processes with the concept that um, core relationships um, need to be understandable, they need to be trend visible. Uh, and we need to be able to have um, levers for um, for um, uh, you know, uh, managing the relationships and that allow for accountability, but more to the point, allow people to make choices and put together new packages, new deals, new value um, that's reliable, that's, um, that's, uh, that's legit. Uh, I will just show you quickly, here's the, this is live demo of code that's still like dripping wet. What will happen? Nobody knows. Okay, I'm clicking the button. Nothing's happening. Okay, something's happening. What do you think? Should I authorize it? Okay, I'm going to authorize it. Aha! Oh, that's okay. That's actually ex supposed to say that. So let's go to my account page. And, haha. Just, you know, refresh that. Haha. Uh -huh. Account page. Oh, maybe I have to go home first. Okay, let's try this one. That was user error, by the way. Actually, <laughs> it did it exactly right. Um, so here we have something. Um, so this is literally looking for my file. I've got Google and not GitHub at this point. Um, I asked him to put a login account, mm -hmm. which is coming from Heroku, just so people can see while wow, the page is definitely changing, and it is changing, like this is a real page. Um, got some stuff we pulled from the profile. I can authorize GitHub from here, but more to the point, look at this little guy here. This is my favorite part. I just click on this, and I go, oh, at last. I can see my freaking account um, for real. I just click that, and here is a file. Here is the path. It's stable. Um, my, the name, location, blah, blah, blah. My current um, uh, things are Google true, GitHub false. Um, I think that's pretty good. We can hash that. We can check it up on the blockchain. We can port it. We can have a blast with it. Uh, and now uh, let's go ahead and authorize. Um, I will authorize um, GitHub. So I'll just do it from inside the session because Oh, and I'd already um, sort of given the permission before, so it remembers that I had the permission, I guess. Uh, let me just get to this again. It should now say that I have both of them authorized. I should have, like, completely logged out of everything in advance so you can see the permissions. Um, but now on the page, okay, like, here are the terms. So I put some placeholder boilerplate stuff up here, but this would be like, you know, like you agree with apps are us, that um, you own your data, like we're liable for nothing, and, um, but just like a, just a little bit, like a little boilerplate at the top, and then right to the auth terms. Because that's the nature, that's the fundamental nature of the deal. That's the sum total of the obligations of the parties. That is the contract. And, um, Gabby will talk in a moment about how we've encapsulated these into cards. So you can basically legal components, and you kind of, one clause per component. Chuck them in, but here's Google's, like uh, I've authorized Google to do this, I've authorized GitHub to do that, and then we'll have some back matter of the contract at the end, like, you know, disputes will be resolved in um, Bangladesh and uh, whatever. Um, so those will all be cards as well. So that is our dynamic contract. Um, and um, let's see, so let's now go to, um, gosh, 114. So let's go to Q and A, I think. Um, and uh, actually, what, what am I forgetting, actually? Um, 
I did not show the roadmap. Uh, would you like to say anything before? Um, I think actually he's actually at work right now. So, um, and he's in from <laughs> India. Oh, there you go. Hello, are you there? Yeah. Hey, Great. Those, hi. So number one, thank you for coding this. Um, you know, in volunteer spirit. Um, and uh, did, did I miss anything you'd like to add? Uh, uh, yeah, definitely. So uh, right now, the, this prototype is uh, you know on a on a server which runs uh, runs Node, and you have simple HTML, CSS, and JavaScript on the front end, right? And the identity files are on the file system of the server. So you know people could uh, think of you know this server as a single point of failure, right? So in the roadmap, we have things like integrating this on uh, IPFS. So IPFS is something which is. Uh... Hey, does I can still help me? Yes, uh, I'm just looking okay. for the um, slides. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so by, so by integrating uh, the ID file on the IPFS, what happens is. Uh, the file is not on a single system, but it's on a peer-to-peer -peer distributed file system. So this way, there's no single point of failure, and uh, though the server might fail, the ID file is still available on uh, other uh, file systems. So this is one thing that we're doing. And the other thing would be uh, having this dynamic contract on the Ethereum blockchain. So uh, this way, uh, you know, we're not limiting ourselves to the regular web, but also uh, we're moving this infrastructure on the blockchain, which is much more reliable and better. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, and so part of so I'm just pulling up. Um, this is the repo here. Uh, we've got a, a, a quick whack of issues for something that we just started um, already. But you can see most of what Akshith said there on the roadmap, which is just to emphasize if you couldn't hear the um, signal that well. We're going to be looking for distributed file sharing um, so that the server is not such a point of failure, especially with the, just the research implementations we have now, but also, frankly, at larger scale. That's good for resilience. It's good for trustworthiness. It's good for reliability. There's business models there. We're going to be using IPFS. It's a blockchain-based distributed thing. Uh, there's also something that Gabriella has discovered at CSAIL called Solid. Um, I guess that's another distributed something that Tim Berners-Lee invented and is supposed to be amazing. Um, but hell, we could use GitHub uh, for you know just distributing the authoritative account files. But so and the distribution of the data is one thing. Another thing is we'll be bringing on more scopes. So we'll be bringing on more identity and uh, and service providers, so we can really see that dynamic contract. Gabriella um, um, worked hard last night at um, implementing Bootstrap and some material design cards, uh, so we could decouple the front end better from what's happening in the back end and encapsulate um, those legal terms as true legal components um, uh, so that the, um, that the clauses and the um, authorizations are humming together in perfect um, synchronous harmony at last. And uh, um, did, 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 what else on the roadmap? Some big things are on the roadmap. We'll be implementing it. Uh, re so we kind of tore the identity system out of the app that it was being used for so that we could get it right in an OAuth pattern in time for this talk. I think that's been done. Um, now we'll be reintegrating it with this app. It's just called Unworkshop. It's basically just a, a, a way that everyone can do ideation at the same time, brainstorm, rate things, and um, actually, if you sequence those the right way, you can do some cool stuff. So we'll be doing that next, reintegrating with that app, and then with a few more apps to make sure we have a, you know, a, a, a identity as a service uh, that's working appropriately. Um, and uh, good lord, um, I think that's oh, and then oh, the lawyers are coming. Uh, so in May we have um, like uh, what we're calling algorithmic law conference, um, which. Um, is also on the roadmap to invent algorithmic law shortly before then or at the conference, no later than the conference. We'll figure out how to better have data-driven um, rules and dynamic systems for contracts, maybe to get better analytics on what clauses to pop in, um, which ones are litigated, which are more performant, um, better templates, um, things that work. You know, so you can do a lot of interesting analytics on, uh, on contracts. And so we're having a you, you're all welcome here uh, to come to the Media Lab May 5th and 6th to an uh, algorithmic law yeah. event where we'll basically battle test some of these ideas uh, more fully. And, uh, and, uh, and, then, and the last thing I'll say is that Gabriella uh, and um, actually have kindly agreed to um, show up at um, our favorite Tuesday half night with Code for America at Cambridge Innovation Center um, a week from today. Um, and we'll be hacking on IAuth. So anybody that's interested in 
front end. Um, Gabrielle is um, a genius, frankly, and a hard worker, but we can all use some help when it comes to um, encapsulating legal terms in material design cards, Lord knows. Uh, and so if anyone's into front end stuff and wants to um, remake the law by encapsulating it um, and engineering it like normal people, um, come on by. Also on the back end, if you would like to um, work on the Node app and then um, our migration to um, Ubuntu, which is important now that we proved the concept, it doesn't, it's not really real until it's just on Ubuntu and, you know, or Debian or something like that in the open, and then we'll kind of dockerize different things, but we have to migrate it or, like, I'll feel the baby isn't, like, safe. It's not, like, it's not viable yet until it's just on a normal, you know, server um, with not, like, the special incubations of uh, Heroku. So those are some of the things that will be happening next. Um, on Tuesday night, just up the road, one Broadway, uh, 7 p.m., Code for America, um, come on by. So with that, I'll hand the mic back to Hetty. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, uh, I think we have time for two questions. Um, so, does who has a question here? I don't. I have one, but okay. So um, questions okay. on cases. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, I think we just it's get those questions at the same time, and then uh, you can answer them. Here comes questions. What's your I've got a GitHub mug. So, just to summarize. <laughs> Uh, a big goal of this project is to put users in control of uh, their identifying data that they share with third parties um, and to make the contracts explicit and human readable. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And so just uh, for our friends that really hacked this, uh, the gentleman confirmed that the main goal is to put users in control of their, and then he said identifiable data, and I'd say of their identity. Of their identity. Um, uh, you know, it was represented um, by um, more or less, you can think of it like a title to a car that indicates ownership, um, but that's right. And then number two, to make the legal terms more explicit, and that's um, confirmed and confirmed. All right, so the question is, what um, what is the contract with those third parties after you revoke their access to your data? Are you requiring them legally to delete what they have on hand for you, or you know, is the idea that the data is so dynamic that you're simply revoking continued access? Is that a problem you're trying to address here? Great. And the question was, um, <clears throat> um, what's the deal after revocation with you know the data on the external systems? Are we you know seeking to control that as well, like have it deleted, for example? And the answer is, um, that's the question. That's that we have to be able to answer at scale. And right now, it's a chaotic, hot mess, and um, it's molten hot. It's unanswerable. It's not tractable, in my view, um, the way things are now. Um, our, my aim with this is um, to have it be better without changing anything on the terms or expectations of what people do with data because it's so much better just to use this. It's so much more organized. It's so much more reliable. It's so much more um, efficient and effective. It makes new combinations and packaging of product and um, you know, compositions of services possible that it sells itself and it tracks open source people and other people to add to it. And then the master plan is <clears throat> a new deal and a very old deal on data. Uh, basically the deal of America and the Commonwealth is that we're free people and free markets. Like, I took an oath to defend the Constitution of Massachusetts when I was a lawyer, and <clears throat> it says pretty plainly, it's like on our website, I put it there in 97, uh, mass.gov, it says the deal is that like weird consent to be governed. So the real deal is that we can revoke consent, and that would mean in some cases that if the consent was to have data and revoking it meant in our terms that you delete the data, you delete the data. Um, if the, if it, what it meant is that you didn't delete the data but you don't get further data, we would see that in the card, and when we revoked it, that would be an auditable, logged thing. So the plan is to create an enforceable, engineered basis that people can know the deal, and that I think a competitive market for people that would be willing to delete your data, and to say that they'll do that, no auth permissions would emerge, and that if they some didn't do it for reasons of incompetence, error, evilness, or whatever, um, we can know that, and now we have something you can easily, almost machinably, bring into court for enforcement. You don't even have to go to court. Like you can have liquidated damages. Like, okay, fifty bucks in PayPal if you didn't delete, you know, these five things. And then look at this spam, naughty. Um, so like now we have an enforceable, engineered, scalable basis to address ownership of data. And deletion is the best way to know who owns something. If they can destroy it, they totally own it. So I think you've asked the right question. What was the second question? Thank you. You're welcome. What's your name? Tyson. Okay, next, good question. 
What's the second one? Cool. My second question is, uh, you mentioned a few people that you're already going to be working with. Why did, uh, what makes them so excited about this project? Thanks. Um, so um, we have a bunch of like what I would call identity at MIT, and then she across America, like uh, mostly in the West Coast, but New York and a bunch of places. Some terrific companies, RSA here, uh, but many uh, like are, are um, true innovators of identity services, and they start with for what we call a user-centered perspective. Um, so the center of the center of all that goodness is something called Internet Identity Workshop. It meets twice. Uh, it's an unworked unconference that meets twice a year in Mountain View. And it's where like all the people really, really into this, like below IETF and below W3C and below like the trade shows, like that's where we really get together and kind of have it out and have a great time and invent things. And like OpenID Connect came from there, uh, OAuth 2 came from there from one of the sessions. Like many great things came from there super upstream. Uh, the, we're inherently interested in identity, those people, and um, so like we kind of fuel each other. Um, I run something in that group called the Legal Forum. Uh, where we've been getting good feedback from people and that, and then also some other standards groups where we've gotten initial feedback. Uh, so I found them just, it's really just the people I currently hang out with that have been validating it. Um, the real power, though, is with um, Akshith and with Gabriella and with, you know, the people that you can't see who have um, labored um, as volunteers, that they saw there's an opportunity to do something better. Uh, and they basically volunteered uh, civic hackers to um, contribute one way or another to this. Um, and, you know, luckily, uh, their story isn't, unknowable because thanks to GitHub we have you know commits and we have issues that go way back across some repositories that uh, we'll be linking but um it, it was if actually then Gabriella had not um, when we were finishing up a blockchain thing expressed interest and even passion about this and a sense that they could do it and that it was important to do and volunteered to do it you know late at night when like you know Gabrielle has a great boyfriend um, that she like wasn't with him for that time because she was just putzing around with me on this and then uh, Ashith has got a job and a bunch of stuff to do like we've been volunteering on this for a while and it was their passion and uh, willingness to volunteer that indicated to me that the time is right it wasn't ready two years ago I don't think anyone even understood what I was talking about uh, people understand it and people are ready to help and so I recognize that pattern pretty well um, it's something that's time is right so we're going so we're going for it also, you come to think of it. So, like Pivotal Labs, and talking about you know, a tech talk. First, I was going to do a boring, buzzword laden thing because I thought that was what I was supposed to do. And uh, <clears throat> I wasn't even looking forward to it that much. Although, I'd like to, I wanted to see what was going on in here because I like Pivotal Tracker. Uh, and so, um, but, um, but the interest in, you know, um, uh, is it Sean Fun? Yeah. Uh, when I when I just said, well, I guess we could. Do, how about IAuth? Because it's been in the back of my head lately. So due to a blockchain, things were coming up that suggested it might be time, maybe. And so I just trotted out there, and she's like, her eyes lit up. She's like, yeah, like you know, our clients have that as an issue. We don't really, you know, there's not a good design pattern. It's interesting to flip it, flip the um, you know, um, pyramid and put the user at the center. Uh, and so she she validated it. So I'd say. You know, Literally, if it hadn't been for Pivotal Labs, um, you know, catalyzing the topic with the talk, which then required, like, some kind of demo, um, this wouldn't be happening. So I'd say those are the three main uh, characters, volunteers, um, MIT people, and you. Oh, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Um, okay, um, so Gabriella and uh, actually, um, <clears throat> thank you for, your, uh, for um, being here and for everything you've done. And uh, you can hang out with all of us and hack this into true existence a week from today at Code for America, and um, I'll, we'll put a, a meetup um, on um, uh, Massachusetts legal hackers and a Code for America, and if you'd be kind enough to um, circulate around to people here, I'd be grateful. We'd love to see you again. I'll stick around for a while for um, conversation, and with that, uh, I thank you very much, and uh, we're going off here. <laughs>